Path 1. Buddha Puja. When a Dan Kao lived in the forests and the mountains, he got the local villagers to lay out three different paths for walking meditation. The first path he used for paying homage to the Lord Buddha, the second for homage to the Tamma, and the third for homage to the Sangha. He walked Jangama on these three paths at three different times each day. As soon as he had finished his morning meal, he began walking meditation on the Buddha Puja path. Stepping forth. Venerable Adan Kao Analeo was born in the Year of the Rat on Sunday, December 28, 1888. His natal village was Ban Bo Chaneng, located in the Nongao sub-district of Amnat Charean district in the province of Ubon Rachatani. His father's name was Pua and his mother's Rot, and their surname was Korata. Kao Korata was the fourth of seven children. Kao Korata was a farmer by profession. Working hard, he prospered and made friends easily. By nature, he was honest and upright, always displaying a warm-hearted, generous attitude toward family and friends. Everyone loved and admired him. Because of this, he had many acquaintances, who were all good, responsible people. In stark contrast to nowadays, when having many friends tends to lead to a lot of drinking and carousing, where friends in this age of instant gratification are the cause of each other's downfall, dragging one another headlong into a living hell. In those days, people tended toward virtuous conduct, so friendships were wonderfully inspiring and mutually beneficial interactions that never led to personal damage. When he was twenty years old, his parents arranged for him to be married. His wife's name was Nang Mi. They had seven children together. He lived the life of a layperson for many years, supporting his family following the customs of the world. It seems, however, that the relationship with his wife was not a smooth and happy one, due to the fact that his wife was never content to remain faithful to her husband. She had a tendency to take advantage of his trusting nature, adulterous behavior that became a poison damaging the heart of her partner, as well as the wealth and stability of their family. An unfaithful spouse is like a destructive parasite which so damages the relationship that husband and wife can no longer remain together. In a John Cow's case, however, one is tempted to speculate that his marital situation turned out to be a great boon for him, the fruition of some favorable gumma. For had he not been so emotionally traumatized, he may never have considered sacrificing everything to ordain as a Buddhist monk. In any event, it seems almost certain that he began seriously considering life as a monk because of his wife's infidelity, and that he finally decided to ordain for precisely this reason. When a wife or a husband has a lover, or a wife has many lovers and a husband many mistresses, the finger of blame points directly at Raga Tanha, the kilesa of sexual craving. Never being satisfied, Raga Tanha sweeps everyone into its defiling sphere of influence, Mahichata, insatiable greed. To avoid damaging the lives of innocent family members, the temptation to commit adultery must be resisted at all costs. Unfortunately, this kind of behavior is widespread, and it seems to increase all the time. For as long as the people of this world are content to follow the lead of sexual craving, they will feel no inclination to view their conduct in the light of Tamma. The Tamma teaches, Sandurte Paramang Tanang, contentment is the greatest treasure. A harmonious, trusting relationship between husband and wife is the essential wealth of any family. The peace and happiness of the family depends on their being able to live in mutual trust and harmony, and on their not going the way of Mahichata, that is, husbands and wives whose illicit lovers consume all their time and interest. Ragatanha, the defilement of sexual craving, is comparable to a kitchen fire. Both are necessary to establishing and maintaining a successful family. Marriage is necessarily a sexual partnership, while a kitchen fire is indispensable for preparing the family's food. 
Just as heat and electricity are common requisites of human life, so too is ragatanha a fundamental aspect of human relations and the driving force behind most human behavior. If both are used carefully with proper circumspection, they can sufficiently fulfill people's basic needs in life. But if people carelessly fail to keep these two fires under control, they can certainly cause a conflagration that destroys everything in its path. For this reason, the wise have always taught human beings who live under the influence of the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion to think in terms of tamma. Tamma is like cool water that quenches fires in the heart, preventing their spreading and gaining such strength that they destroy the world we live in. So to prevent their becoming a danger to ourselves and others, we should watch over the fires of the heart in the same way that we watch over the kitchen fire to safeguard our family and our possessions. When Adan Kao saw the woman he loved to the bottom of his heart change, endangering and threatening to destroy his heart in a way he never imagined possible, he made up his mind to ordain as a monk. He was disgusted and so enraged seeing his wife's blatant infidelity that he could hardly control himself. Fortunately, he had sufficient inherent virtue to realize just in time that if I kill her, she will suffer enormous pain, regardless of the fact that she is guilty and knows she's guilty. After all, even an insect bite can be unbearably painful, how much more so the intense pain of death. So I must restrain myself and carefully consider the consequences before it's too late. Why am I so eager to commit such a heinous crime? It is despicable behavior that all good people abhor and all wise men strongly denounce. What benefit can I possibly gain from killing her? All I'll gain is a heavy penalty of intense suffering bounding back to burn me. Am I the only man who has an unfaithful wife? Hasn't Everyone in the world, including the Buddha, his Arahant disciples, and respected Atans, encountered similar hellish situations in their lives? Am I really the only one? I must consider quickly and make the right decision. Otherwise, I'll so damage myself that I'll have no virtue left capable of leading me to a good rebirth in the future. My reaction to circumstances like this shall become the yardstick by which I measure how clever or how stupid I am, and whether I will progress successfully or whether I am doomed to failure. Throughout history, wise people have never allowed themselves to be overpowered by the evils of this world. Instead, they have thought up clever ways of turning the poisons of evil into a rich fertilizer, nourishing tamma in the heart. So why should I be willing to render myself a worthless person by doing an evil deed just because someone else has deeply offended me? The world we live in is full of injustices. Why should I allow them to dictate my behavior? If I am unable to constrain myself now, how will I ever be able to live a life of virtue? By succumbing to the power of a sexual craving that knows no bounds, my wife has abused my trust in her. Should I now abuse her by self-righteously succumbing to the power of anger? If I take my revenge by killing both my wife and her lover, which of us would be more despicable? According to the Buddha's teaching, I would be committing such a grave gamma that no amount of love and compassion could absolve me or save me from a certain descent into the agonies of hell. Am I going to put my trust in the anger that is engulfing my heart at this moment, or will I put my faith in the tamma of the Lord Buddha, a teaching that has always effectively diminished the pain and suffering of living beings? Consider quickly and make the right decision, otherwise the malevolent power of the Kilesas will overtake the Tamma and totally destroy me. Adan Kao said that it was incredibly strange and amazing how at the moment that this warning thought arose, it was as if a revered Adan was sitting right in front of him, calming his emotions. His heart which had been like a blazing fire ready to burn to ashes the cause of its misery, suddenly went unusually still and calm. 
He felt a deep sense of sadness and dismay about his wife's infidelity. At the same time, he pitied her and forgave her from the bottom of his heart. At that moment, he saw clearly the potential harm caused by anger and resentment. When Thamma arose and his heart went completely still and quiet, Azan Kao felt that he had been mercifully spared from rebirth in hell. He felt relieved and supremely peaceful at that moment, as though he had been born once again within the same mind and body. This caused him to reflect back on the tight bind he had found himself in, and on how he had almost destroyed himself unwittingly by succumbing to the power of anger. He then reflected on how he should properly conduct himself so as not to become contaminated by the same kinds of evil, destructive thoughts in the future, abhorrent thoughts that appalled and disgusted him. Previous to this incident, Adan Kao had thought only about how to fulfill his worldly ambitions. After his wife's infidelity inspired him to think about Thamma, most of his thinking was focused in that direction, which in turn led to his resolution to be ordained as a monk. He finally realized the harmfulness of the lay person's life, where his hopes and dreams were more likely to meet with disappointment than they were fulfillment. In the end, he was so severely hurt that he could hardly bear it. Placing his entire faith in Thamma, he decided to ordain and practice the way of the Buddha to the utmost of his strength and ability. Once he had informed his family and friends of his decision, he entered the local monastery as a white-robed Upasaka with the intention of becoming a monk as soon as possible. Azan Kao later explained his predicament like this. As a layman, I worked very hard to support my family, but the fruits of my labor were just barely sufficient to meet our needs. Often we had to go without. So, out of concern for my family, I decided to travel to the Central Plains region and hire myself out as a farm laborer. I worked hard and saved my money. Then I returned home. Unfortunately, upon my return I discovered that my wife had a lover. At that moment I nearly lost control of myself. I found them sleeping together. Having been forewarned by some of my friends in the village, I crept up on them in the middle of the night with a machete in my hand. I raised the machete over my head, ready to strike them both with all my strength. But by chance her lover saw me first. Trembling with fear, he raised his hands and pleaded with me to spare his life. He admitted that he had done something terribly wrong. At that very moment, the thought arose, he's admitted his guilt. Don't do it! Don't do it! It will only make matters much worse. Nothing good can come out of it. I felt pity for that man who was so terrified of dying, and my anger subsided. I quickly called the other villagers to come and bear witness, so that no one would have doubt as to the truth of the situation. In front of the entire assembly, which included the village headman and all of my relatives, I pressed serious charges against my wife's lover. He responded by publicly confessing everything, and agreed to pay a fine. I then announced for all to hear that I was ceding my wife to her lover. Having cut off the urge for revenge, I felt relieved, although I remained deeply dismayed by what happened. I had lost faith in life, and I felt no motivation to pick up the pieces and start my worldly life over again. I thought only of how I wished to become a monk, so that I could escape these circumstances and transcend this wretched world. Going beyond the world to attain Nibbana following the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples was the only course I was willing to contemplate. It was for this reason that I ordained, and it is for this reason that I have practiced Tamma diligently all my life. I became a bhikkhu in great haste, because I was so disgusted and dismayed that it weighed heavily on my heart. Nothing could have stopped me at that time. Azan Kao's ordination took place at Wat Bodhi Sri Monastery on May 2nd, 1919. Prakro Puttisak was his Upataya, and the Jan Bunjan was his Gammawatariya. 
He stayed at Wat Bodhi Sri, studying the principles of Dhamma and Vinaya for six years. During his stay there, he observed that the conduct of his teachers and his fellow monks was erratic. They were often neglectful in their observance of monastic discipline and unreliable in their practice of meditation. What he saw was contrary to his own pure intentions to ordain solely for the realization of Magga and Pala. After considering the matter over and over very carefully, he decided to leave the relative security of the monastery to pursue the wandering lifestyle of a Tutanga monk. He then made his decision known to the abbot and his family and friends. Entering the Tutanga Path Before leaving his village to practice Gamartana, Adan Kao received nothing but discouragement from practically everybody he met, both lay people and bhikkhus alike. All of them said that nowadays it was impossible to attain the path, fruition, and nibbana, that the era was long past when this could be done, that however rightly and properly one were to practice the way of the Tamma and Vinaya, one would not be able to attain the desired results and reach the goal, that the practice of meditation makes people mad, so whoever wants to go mad should practice it, that if one aspires to be a good person in society, one should not drive oneself mad by going the way of Gamartana. That in this age there are no Tutanga Gamartana bhikkhus, except for those who sell magic yantras, mantras, lockets which have magic properties, magic potions for influencing others, ways of making people impervious to bullets and knives, knowledge of auspicious times and astrology. They assured him that as far as finding Tutanga Gamartana bhikkhus who actually practiced the way of Tutanga, there were none left nowadays, so he must not waste his time and tire himself to no purpose, for to get to a state of ease and happiness in that way was impossible. These were some of the many obstacles which blocked the path of those who wanted to practice the way of the Tutangas in those days. But Venerable Adan Kao was not prepared to listen to any of them, although he did not object or argue with them, for it would not have been useful to either side. But deep within himself he considered that these people are not the owners of the Buddhist religion. They are not the owners of the path fruition and nibbana, nor have they any power to make anyone else go mad. So why should I believe what they say? I have faith only in the Lord Buddha, in the Tamma, and in the Sangha of Savaka Arhans as being truly worthy within the Triple World. Those who spoke trying to persuade me to stop, so that I would not go the way of Gamartana and practice its various methods, are not those who are truly worthy at all. Just by looking at the behavior and manners they display, one can know whether they are truly wise or simply foolish, and generally what their characters are like. Their objections in wanting to stop me are things which would be a waste of time for me to even consider, so I must now go away to practice the way of Gamartana as soon as I can without considering anything else. I must search for true things which accord with the basic principles of Tamma that have been handed down to us. I must strive in this way until I reach the absolute limit of my strength and ability. If I should chance to die in the process, then I willingly give my life and entrust myself to the Supreme Tamma. As he prepared to set out on his Tutanga wanderings, all his fellow bhikkhus and many lay people gathered in the monastery to see him off. Just before he left, he spoke truthfully from his heart to those who had tried to stop him, so as to leave no doubt about his intentions, saying, When I have gone from here, Unless I can teach myself to attain the ultimate level of citta and tamma, I shall not return to show my face amongst you again. I am ready to die for the sake of realizing the true nature of tamma with clarity and insight, but not for anything else. Please remember what I have said, just in case I have the right characteristics that enable me to return and meet you again. The only likelihood of my meeting you again will be if I realize the true nature of Tamma with clarity and absolute certainty. He said this at a time when many people were gathered there, both highly respected bhikkhus and the lay people from his village who had faith in them as being very wise and learned monks, 
and all of them tried to stop him from going away. He remembered, at that time, my heart seemed so strong it could crush a diamond to powder in an instant. It seemed as if I could leap into the sky and walk about up there for all of them to see. This was probably due to pride and high spirits in my heart, as though it were shining forth brightly for all those people to see, telling them, See here, the diamond radiance in this heart, can't you see it? Are you all stupid enough to disparage me, saying that I will go mad by delving into strange things? My heart is not in the same sphere as all of yours, such that you can gather it up into your clan to die worthlessly in the way a dog dies. I am not prepared to die in the way that all of you would lead me towards death right now, for I intend to die in the way that the Lord Buddha taught us, by not leaving any seed of becoming remaining whatsoever. I have already died in your way so many countless times that it is impossible to tell in how many cemeteries I have ended my days. But although I may not be able to know this with my own higher knowing faculty, I have faith in the Lord Buddha and his teaching, for his higher knowing faculty was supreme and unequaled. As soon as he was ready, he said farewell, and took his leave of all the bhikkhus and learned people and walked away through a large crowd of lay followers. He then set out for Tatpanom on foot through thick forests and jungles, following paths worn by people and buffalo carts, for in those days there were no roads, not even the roughest dirt roads, but only footpaths. Many types of wild animals inhabited the forests. Large numbers of elephants and tigers roamed everywhere, since there were no villages, and not as many people about as there are nowadays. Those forests were the original virgin forests, so there was a real danger that if one became lost, one would have no food and might die in the forest. Often a person could walk all day without meeting anyone or seeing any sign of habitation. Venerable Ajahn Kao walked through thick forests until he reached Patpanom. He wanted to find Venerable Adan Man and study the way of practice with him. Adan Kao knew of Adan Man's peerless reputation and was determined to seek him out. He had heard that Adan Man and Adan Sa were staying at Taboa in Nongkai province, so from Tatpanom he set out walking to Nongkai, a distance of some two hundred and seventy miles. Wandering by stages, he reached Nongkai in several months and went to see Adan Man. He related, I was only able to spend a short time training with him before he went away and disappeared into silence. Then I felt a sense of hopelessness for a while, because I had no teacher to teach and guide me. Several years later, I heard that Venerable Ajahn Mun had gone to stay and practice the way in the Chiang Mai area, so I set out to follow him by wandering in the Tutanga Gamartana way going along the bank of the Meigong River until I reached the province of Chiang Mai. Then I wandered about in the various districts of Chiang Mai with peace and happiness. The places where Adan Kao stayed and practiced were deep in the forests and hills, and far away from any villages. At that time, Venerable Adan Man was also wandering about in the same area, but it was not easy to find him, because he always liked to wander alone away from his colleagues, and he would not readily allow others to meet him. Adhan Kao continued following him relentlessly, without success, for about a year, until he finally gave up hope of ever finding a John Mun, and began walking back toward the northeast region. He walked as far as Lambang, where he met Adhan Wan, whom he had known previously. Ajahn Wan said that he knew where to find Ajahn Mun, so they decided to go together in search of him. They eventually found him at Wat Ba Myang Hui Sai in the Prao district of Chiang Mai province. Ajahn Mun preferred to live alone, so Ajahn Kao and Ajahn Wan camped in the mountains nearby and came often to get instructions from him. When the Vasa period approached, he insisted that Ajahn Kao and Ajahn Wan find another monastery to spend the retreat because the villagers supporting Ajahn Mun's retreat were poor and could not afford to support many monks. 
Ajahn Kao said that he always tried to stay close by Venerable Ajahn Man so that he could go to see him and learn from him when it was necessary. Whenever he approached Ajahn Man to seek his advice about an aspect of Tamma, his teacher always had compassion for him and taught him to the utmost of his ability without holding back or hiding anything. But he would never let anybody stay with him. Still, Ajahn Kao said that he was quite content that Ajahn Man had compassion for him and taught him at those times when it was necessary to go and ask him questions. Once he had cleared up his problems, he paid his respects and left Ajahn Man to live alone, putting into practice what he had learned. In this manner, he traveled back and forth quite often. After living like this for several years, Venerable Ajahn Man very kindly let him stay with him for the Vasa period. Ajahn Kao was so glad and so happy when Venerable Ajahn Man told him the news that he felt as if he could float in the air, for after trying for so many years he had at last succeeded. From then on he stayed regularly with Ajahn Man during the Vasa. The practice and development of Ajahn Kao's Jitta Pawana meditation steadily gained strength after he went to stay in the Chiang Mai region. With a skilled teacher to guide and teach him continually, his heart seemed as though it were about to leap into the sky, so strong was his happiness and contentment in the tamma that arose in his heart. No longer was there any unease or sadness due to his practice being up and down, sometimes progressing and sometimes declining, as happened when he was staying in other places. From day to day, his heart steadily progressed, both in samadhi and in wisdom, and he became engrossed in striving day and night without ever becoming satiated. A Special Affinity for Elephants Once, a Zan Kao was wandering Totanga in the Chiang Mai Mountains with a Jan Man and a Jan Maha Tongsak. As they reached a narrow gap in the path leading up the mountain, they chanced upon a large, solitary elephant whose owner had released it and then wandered off someplace. All they could see there was a gigantic elephant with huge six-foot tusks searching for food. Quite a fearsome sight. They conferred among themselves about how to proceed. This was the only path up the mountain, and it allowed no room for going around the elephant. Ajahn Man told Ajahn Kao to speak with the elephant, which was eating bamboo leaves at the side of the path. Standing about twenty yards away with its back to them, it had yet to notice their approach. Ajahn Kao addressed the elephant. Big Brother Elephant, we wish to speak with you. At first the elephant did not clearly hear his voice, but it did stop chewing the bamboo leaves. Big Brother Elephant, we wish to speak with you. Clearly hearing this, the elephant suddenly swung around to face the monks. It stood stock still, its ears fully extended. Big brother elephant, we wish to speak with you. You are so very big and strong. We are just a group of monks, so weak and so very frightened of you, big brother. We would like to walk past where you are standing. Would Big Brother please move over a bit so that we have room to pass by? If you keep standing there, it really frightens us, so we don't dare walk past. As soon as he finished speaking, the elephant immediately turned to the side and thrust its tusks into the middle of a clump of bamboo, signaling its intention to let them pass unharmed. Seeing it facing the clump of bamboo, Azan Man told the others that they could continue on as it would not bother them now. The two monks invited Ajahn Man to walk between them, with Ajahn Kao walking in front and Ajahn Maha Tongsak following behind. They walked past in single file only six feet from the elephant's rear end without incident. But as they were walking away, by chance the hook on Ajahn Maha Tongsak's umbrella got tangled in some bamboo just a few yards past the elephant. It defied all attempts to extract it, so he was forced to struggle with it for quite some time. Terrified of the elephant, which was now looking right at him, he was soon drenched in sweat. Fighting desperately to disentangle the hook, he glanced up at the eyes of the elephant, 
which stood there like a huge stuffed animal. He could see that its eyes were bright and clear. In truth, its countenance inspired affection rather than fear, but at that moment his fear remained strong. When he finally did get free, his fear subsided, and he realized that this elephant was a very endearing animal. Seeing that they were all safely passed, Azan Kao turned to the elephant. Hey, big brother, we've all passed by now. Please relax and eat in peace. As soon as he finished speaking, the sound of crunching, breaking bamboo filled the air. Later, the monks praised this intelligent elephant, agreeing that it was an animal that inspired affection and sympathy. The only faculty it lacked was the ability to speak. Ajahn Maha Tongsak was truly amazed how Ajahn Kao was able to speak with the elephant as though it were just another human being. Big brother, your little brothers are frightened and dare not pass. Please make way so that we can go by without fearing big brother. As soon as it received that bit of flattery, it was so pleased that it immediately prepared to make way for them. On another occasion, Venerable Adan Ka was spending the Vassa period together with another bhikkhu. Late one night, when it was very quiet, he was sitting in meditation in a small hut. That night, a large elephant, whose owner had let it loose to wander in the forest to find its own food, walked slowly towards the back of his hut. Adan Kao did not know where it had come from. Right behind his hut was a large boulder blocking the way, so the elephant could not get any closer to him. When it got to the boulder, it stretched its trunk out into the hut until it touched his glaude and the mosquito net above his head while he was sitting in meditation. The sound of its breathing was loud as it sniffed him, and he felt the coolness of it on his head while his glaude and mosquito net swung back and forth. Meanwhile, Adan Kao sat repeating the Parikamma Butto, putting everything he had into it, not having anything else to rely upon, he entrusted his heart and life to the genuine Butto. The large elephant continued to stand there quietly for about two hours, as if it was waiting to catch him when he moved, ready to tear him to pieces. Once in a while he heard its breath sniffing him from outside the mosquito net. When it finally moved, it drew back, walked to the western end of the hut, and reached into a basket of sour tamarinds, which lay people had brought Adan Kao to clean the lid of his bowl, then started to eat them, making a loud, crunching noise as if they were delicious. Adan Kao thought, Those tamarinds for cleaning my bowl lid are going to be cleaned out. Soon there will be none left for sure. If the owner of this big belly finishes them off and cannot find any more, it is sure to come into my hut and find me and tear me to bits. So I'd better go out and speak to it and tell it some things that it should know. This animal knows the language of people quite well since it has lived with people for a long time. When I speak to it, it will be more likely to listen to me than to be stubborn and difficult. If it becomes stubborn and belligerent, it will probably kill me. But even if I don't go out and talk to it, once it has eaten all the tamarinds, it's bound to come this way and find me. If it is going to kill me, there will be no way to escape since it's late at night and too dark for me to see where I am going. Having come to this decision, he left his small hut and stood in front, hiding behind a tree. He started to speak to the elephant, saying, Big brother, your small brother would like to say a few words to you. Please listen to what I have to say to you now. As soon as the elephant heard the sound of his voice, it went completely still and quiet without making a move. Then a John Cow spoke to it in a mild, persuasive manner, saying, Big brother, you have been brought up by people who have looked after you at their homes until you have now become fully domesticated. You are thus fully aware of the ways of people, including the language that they speak, which they have used to teach you for many years. You know all these things very well. In fact, you know them even better than some people do. So, big brother, you should also know the customs and laws of people, and you should not just do anything that you feel like doing as it suits your fancy. When you act in ways that are contrary to the ways of human beings, you can easily upset people. Then they may harm you, or, depending on what you do, they may even kill you. 
People are far more intelligent than all other animals in the world. All animals fear people more than any other species. You, big brother, are in subjection to people, so you should respect their ways, for human beings are more intelligent than you are. If you're even a little bit stubborn or difficult, they beat you painfully on the head with a hook. If you are very bad, they will probably kill you. Please don't forget what your little brother has taught out of compassion for you. Your little brother is a bhikkhu, so I will give you the five sila. You should keep them well. Then, when you die, you will go to a state of happiness. At least you should be born as a human being with merit and the virtue of tamma in your heart. Should you be born higher than that, you may go to the heaven realms or brahmaloka or higher still. All of those births are far superior to being born as an animal like an elephant or a horse, which are used to draw carts or to drag logs about while being beaten with whips. Such a life is nothing but torment and trouble that lasts until one dies, without there being any chance to get free from that burden, just like the life you must put up with at present. Big Brother, please listen carefully and make a true resolve to accept the moral precepts. They are, firstly, Barna Dibada. You must not kill people or animals deliberately by taking advantage of your strength and ability to do so. And also, you must not mistreat or oppress others, whether people or animals. To do such things is to do evil. Secondly, Adinadana. You must not steal or take for yourself things which belong to others, or which others are keeping for their own use. Such as the tamarind in that basket which Big Brother was eating just now. They were given to me by people for cleaning the lid of my bowl. But I don't take offense at this, for I don't want you to make any evil gumma at all. I just mentioned it to show you that it's something that has an owner. If things such as that are not given to you, you should not eat them, nor should you walk over them, trampling on them and damaging them. Thirdly, Game Sumitatara. You must not have sexual intercourse with any animal which already has a mate, for this is wrong. If you have sexual intercourse, it should only be with one who has no mate, for this is not wrongdoing. Fourthly, Musavada. You must not lie or deceive. Let your actions and your behavior be true and straightforward, not deceitful in such a way that they give a wrong impression or fool others. That is also wrong and evil. Fifthly, Sara Meraya Madza Bamada Tana. You must not consume anything which causes intoxication or drunkenness, such as alcoholic liquors. To do so is wrong and evil. You must keep these precepts. For if you don't, you can fall into hell when you die. There you will have to put up with great suffering for long periods of time, perhaps for aeons, before you reach the end of the gamma that led you to hell and you can rise out of it. But even after getting free from hell, there will still be some remainder of your evil gamma, which will lead you to life after life as a ghost, a demon, or an animal. In those births, you will still suffer the results of the evil gamma you made. Only then will you be able to take birth as a human being, a birth very difficult to attain because of the bad gumma which oppresses you and holds you down. So, big brother, you must remember well what I have said and practice what I have taught you. Then you will get free from life as an animal and be born as a human being, or a devata, in your next life for sure. That is all I have to teach you now. I hope that big brother will be glad to do these things. Now you may go find a place to rest, or something to eat, as you wish. Your younger brother will now go and practice his meditation. He will share some of his virtue with you and spread out metta to his big brother, so that you will never be lacking in happiness. Now, big brother, it is time for you to go elsewhere. It was most remarkable that for the whole time that he was teaching it, that large elephant stood absolutely still, as though it were made of rock. It did not fidget or move at all, but stood motionless until he had finished speaking. Then, as soon as he had given the sila with his blessings and told it to go, it began to move its huge body, making a noise like an earthquake while it drew back, turned around, and went off. It walked away in a deliberate, thoughtful manner, as if it truly understood everything it had heard. 
Thinking about this incident, I cannot help feeling a lot of sympathy for one whose body was that of an animal, but whose heart was that of a human being, able to appreciate the teaching on good and evil that it received without being obstinate or arrogant, as one might expect from such a large and strong animal. In fact, it was very mild-mannered, and appeared to appreciate the moral teaching throughout, and as soon as Ajahn Kao told it to go, it immediately turned around and went away. While listening to his teaching, it listened so attentively that it almost stopped breathing, just like those who listen to a Tamma talk given by Bhikkhu should, with full respect for Tamma. Ajahn Kao was amazing as well. He was so skilled in his speech and his choice of words that even human beings would have been enraptured and carried away by his talk, much less an animal like an elephant. He used the most sweet and honeyed language with such skill that it would be rare to find anyone else who could do this, and equally rare to listen to it. So the elephant listened with rapt attention, not fidgeting or even moving its ears until he had finished giving his tamma talk. When he told it to go away, it obeyed, and went to find something to eat in the manner of an unusually noble animal. The whole incident makes one reflect even more deeply how, if something is experienced that brings satisfaction, whether to a human or animal, that tends to make their hearing clear and lucid, and their sight bright, as though night becomes day. The heart is absorbed with piti satisfaction and joyful gladness while listening to the enchanting words of the teaching which are always desirable and of which one can never have enough because they are things that are greatly valued by the heart venerable Adan Kao continued to flatter the big elephant for quite a long time until it became fascinated and mesmerized by the sweet gentle words which resonated deep inside for example big brother you are very strong whereas I am small and my strength cannot compare with yours, so I feel afraid of you. Such flattery being one of the most powerful ways of enchantment, he talked like this until the great elephant went into a trance while standing there, oblivious to everything else. It would even have been glad to disgorge the sour tamarinds that it had swallowed, to put them back in the basket for its charming little brother, without keeping even the taste of them. For this act was a disgrace to the dignity of an intelligent and noble elephant, a walking store of virtue. Once its belly was full of Adan Kao's teachings, it went off to find food, and never again came to bother him throughout the rest of the Vasa period. It's quite remarkable that the heart of an animal can have so much understanding. After the Vasa, Adan Kao left that place wandering wherever he felt it was good to go for the purpose of practicing the way of Tamma ever higher and higher. Venerable Ajahn Kao was an earnest Gamatana Bhikkhu who possessed a resolute and courageous character. Whatever he did, he did truly. When he was staying in the hills, he got the lay supporters to make up three paths for walking Chankama. The first one he used for paying homage, Buddha, to the Lord Buddha the second to the Tamma, and the third to the Salaka Sankha of the Lord. He walked Jankama on these three paths at different times of the day according to a fixed schedule which he kept to quite strictly. As soon as he had finished his meal in the morning, he walked Jankama on the first path paying homage to the Buddha, and continued walking until about midday. At two o'clock in the afternoon, he started walking on the path dedicated to the Tamma, and continued walking until four p.m., when it was time to sweep the grounds and bathe. When he had finished doing all his duties, he started to walk Jankama on the path reserved for paying homage to the Sankha. He continued walking until 10 or 11 p.m., after which he rested, sitting in meditation for a while before lying down to sleep. As soon as he woke up, he would begin his Samadhi meditation practice again. This lasted until dawn, when he walked Jankama until it was time for him to go and Pindapada. Some nights, he would sit in meditation practice the whole night, not getting up from his seat until dawn. Normally, when he sat in Samadhi meditation, his heart was very bright after he had finished. But at those times when he sat all night in meditation, the material world disappeared entirely from his awareness, and even his physical body seemed to have gone as well. 
It was altogether a most remarkable and wonderful thing, right from the time that he sat down to examine painful feeling, the Kavedana, until it died away and ceased due to his examination of the pain, which took his chitta deep into a subtle and intimate state of calm. At that point, the only thing apparent to him was knowing, just this alone. This brought him a calm and happiness so subtle and gentle that it was quite indescribable. There were no supporting conditions, aramana, however subtle, present in the citta. This means that the elements of existence, lokatatu, disappeared simultaneously with the disappearance of the supporting conditions. This state remained until the citta withdrew from it, after which the supporting conditions that are the usual companions of the citta gradually returned, bit by bit. Afterwards, he would continue working at his practice in the normal way. When the citta has integrated and gone down into a state of calm, it may remain in that state for several hours, but there is no feeling of it being a long time such as it might normally appear to be. This must surely be the state of eka citta, eka tamma, one citta, one tamma, just within the heart alone, without there being anything else to form a duality. Only when withdrawing from that state is it possible to know that the citta integrated into a state of calm and remained there for so long, for so many hours. On those nights when his meditation practice went smoothly and attained calm easily, even if he sat the whole night through, it seemed like he had only been sitting for two or three hours. There were simply no hindrances to oppress him. Venerable Ajahn Kao tended to encounter dangerous situations in connection with elephants more than any other animals. Soon after the previous encounter, he met another large elephant in the Mebang district of Lambang province, and this time he was almost unable to save himself. This one was a true wild forest elephant, and not one that had lived with and been looked after by people like the previous one. It was at night and Ajahn Kao was walking Jangama when he heard the sound of an elephant crashing through the jungle, breaking branches and making a lot of noise. It was rushing towards him, getting closer every minute, and there was no time for him to run away from it. Then he remembered how forest elephants are usually afraid of fire. So he quickly left the Jangama path and went to get all his remaining candles from the place where he was staying. He then stuck them into the ground all along the sides of his Jankama path, and lit them as fast as he could. To any person who saw it, this would be a beautiful, peaceful sight, but it is hard to say how an elephant will react to it. By the time he had finished setting up the candles, the elephant was almost upon him, giving him no possible way of escape. All he could do was to set up a true resolve, such a Atirtana, that the supernatural power of the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha might come to help and protect him, a servant of the Lord Buddha, against this huge elephant. By that time the elephant had arrived. Stopping about two meters away from him at one side of his Junkama path, it stood there without moving, its ears spread out. It was clearly visible in the candlelight, its huge body appearing as large as a hill. Meanwhile, Ajahn Kao started walking Jangama, pacing back and forth, as if he was not concerned about the elephant at all, although in fact he was so afraid of it that he could hardly breathe. When he first saw it charging towards him, so strong and aggressive, he focused his attention solely on Butto and held on to it tenaciously as the guarantor of his safety. Apart from that, he thought of nothing else. He did not even let his thoughts go out to the giant elephant as large as a hill, which had come to stand by the side of his Chankama path, for he was afraid that his Chitta might slip from Butto, which was his best refuge at that time. Butto and the Chitta then became one and the same thing, until the heart lost all fear, and there remained just knowing and the repetition of Butto, which were blended into one. Meanwhile, the elephant just stood there like a mountain, looking at him without fidgeting or moving, its ears spread wide as if to indicate that it was not ready to accept any friendly advances. 
This accorded with the manner in which it charged towards Ajahn Kao when it first approached him, coming straight for him without hesitating. It acted as though it intended to crush him to death. But when it reached him, it just stood there like a lifeless dummy. As soon as the Chitta and Bhutto went inward and came together, becoming one and the same thing, Ajahn Kao lost all fear. In fact, he felt positively bold and daring, confident that he could have walked right up to the elephant without the least feeling of fear. Having thought about it, he realized that to walk right up to such a wild jungle animal would be an act of carelessness based on conceit, which he shouldn't do. So he kept on fearlessly walking Changuma in competition with the standing elephant, as though nothing could happen that would be any danger to him. The elephant must have stood there for about an hour, by which time the candles were almost finished. Some had already gone out, and the rest would not last much longer, when the elephant backed away, turned round, and walked off by the way it had come. It then went looking for food in the forest around that area, where it could be heard breaking branches and treading on dead wood, making a lot of noise. This was the first time that Venerable Ajahn Kao saw for himself the extraordinary power of the Chitta and Bhutto. He was faced with a critical situation without any way to escape or hide, so there was no alternative but to face up to it using these methods. If he died, it would be only because there was no way to avoid it. This experience made him fully confident that no matter what happened, if the Chitta and Bhutto became intimately blended together in a natural way, nothing could possibly do any harm to him. He said that he became absolutely convinced of this, and has remained so ever since. It was also very strange how the elephant, instead of becoming wild and violent when it reached him, just stood there quite calmly, its ears spread wide as it watched him walking in meditation without getting tired of it. Once it had seen enough, it drew back turned round and went on its way searching for food in a manner that showed its stomach had lost all its former aggression. One cannot help but feel more sympathy for this elephant than for the previous one, which was a domesticated animal that knew the language of people quite well. But this elephant had been a wild animal living in the forest since birth, and it must have been over a hundred years old by then. As it was most unlikely that this one knew the language of people, Ajahn Kao did not speak to it at all. Instead, he simply continued walking Junkama. Unlike the first elephant, this one did not have a halter around its neck. The villagers later told him that it was a wild elephant that had been the leader of a herd for a long time. Why it should have been wandering about on its own at that time, nobody could say. Perhaps it just left the herd for a short time. Even after the elephant had gone, Ajahn Kao continued walking Junkama with an amazing feeling in his heart as he realized the value of that elephant which had come to help his jitta to see the wonderful nature of Tamma in connection with fear and fearlessness. It enabled him to understand it with absolute clarity, leaving no room for any doubt at all. For that reason, it would not be wrong to look on this elephant as being something created by the devas for his benefit. Normally, forest elephants are not used to people, nor do they act peacefully towards them. Only when they are truly overpowered and cannot attack do they quickly flee and try to escape to save themselves. But this one came walking straight towards me of its own free will. With its eyes wide open, it came right up close, well within the light of the candles that I had set in place. But it did not squash me or tear me to pieces. Nor was it startled and frightened by the fire of the candles, for it did not run away into the forest to save itself from the fire. Instead, after walking up to me in a bold, imposing manner, like it was the boss, it just stood there for over an hour, appearing neither aggressive nor afraid. After that, it simply went away. This is what made me think about that animal with amazement, so much so that I have not forgotten it to this day. Because my heart had full faith in Tamma from then on, no matter where I wandered or where I lived, I was never afraid. As it says in the Tamma Pada, Tamma guards those who practice the way. 
Tamma never lets them die, buried in mud or water like an old log of wood. Knowledge of the Chitta and Tamma that truly reaches the heart is most likely to be found at those times when we are in a critical situation. When a situation is not really critical, the Chitta tends to act up and become agitated by endless kinds of Gilesas, so much so that we can hardly keep up with them. In fact, we are likely to let them inundate us, even though we see them in full view. It's as if we are unable to restrain the Kilesas, or even keep pace with them long enough to deal with them effectively. But when the situation is truly critical, so that we are actually driven into a corner, the Chitta and Tamma become strengthened. Though where the strength comes from is hard to say. The heart then bows down and submits putting its faith in Tamma without resisting. Then when we decide to focus it on any aspect of Tamma, it stays right there without balking. This is probably due to the fear of dying, which might well happen if the Chitta were uncooperative. So the Chitta becomes compliant and easy to teach, thus losing its stubbornness at such times. This is probably the reason why Tūtanga Kamatana Bhikkhus like going into the forests and hills, even though they are quite afraid of death, and one part of their hearts does not want to go to such places. My chitta was like that. I cannot speak for other people's hearts, but if they are determined and fully committed to training themselves so as to get to the causes and reach the results of the way of truth, it should be much the same for them as well. The chitta is the dwelling place of both tamma and the kilesas, Factors that can make people feel either full of courage or full of fear, full of goodness or full of evil. Training in accordance with the right causes brings those results which are the purpose and aim of Tamma. Such training is able to make all the various kinds of Gilesas surrender and vanish, until they have all gone, without leaving any trace or seed that could grow again. For myself, I have a rather coarse and rough character, so I tend to have confidence in the strict discipline and rough methods that enable me to counteract those gross natural tendencies within me called the Gilesas, like that time when the large elephant came walking up to me while I was walking Junkama. That was a time when I clearly saw the Gilesas as well as the Tamma of the Lord Buddha within my heart. Normally. The heart which is dominated by the Kilesas is very difficult to discipline and train. Sometimes those who set out to destroy their Kilesas end up dying before they succeed in doing so. That is because of the mean tenacity of the Asavas which have been feeding on our hearts for many ages. But as soon as I got to the point where there was no escape, when that great elephant came to help me, the most stubborn Kilesas, the ones which had been so clever at resisting my efforts, all went into hiding, though where they went I don't know. Then it became easy to instruct the heart. When I ordered the heart to remain fixed to an aspect of Tamma, it immediately agreed and did so. It was as if oil had been put into the machinery so that there was virtually no friction as there had been before. As soon as the Gilesas left the heart, the Tamma, which was already developed and just waiting there, arose at the same moment and shone forth brightly. Simultaneously, courage and fearlessness towards everything immediately arose within the heart. All those things that I had sought for so long were there for me to see and admire to my heart's content. Meanwhile, the fear of death had disappeared. Where to, I don't know, but it enabled me to see quite clearly that fear is a kilesa which has always asserted control over my heart. As soon as the fear that was oppressing and deceiving my heart disappeared, even though it may not have disappeared entirely, I saw quite clearly at that moment how baneful a thing it is. After that, whenever fear arose, as it did at times, I knew that what I experienced then was enough to remind me that this fear is not my friend, but an enemy who has come in the guise of a friend. It could no longer make my heart have confidence in it as before. I resolved that throughout my life of striving for Tamma, I will endeavor to drive it out every time it arises, until the essential nature of this enemy posing as a friend has entirely disappeared from my heart. Only then can I relax and be happy and free from all kinds of concerns and anxieties. 
It seems to me that if we take refuge in Tamma, take real interest in Tamma, love and attend closely to Tamma, and practice it truly in the way that the Buddha proclaimed it to us with complete certainty and true metta, then the realization of Tamma at its various levels will no longer be beyond our reach. Certainly, we will be able to experience Tamma naturally in the same way that they realized it at the time of the Lord Buddha. The reason why the present age and its people are so different from those at the time of the Lord Buddha, insofar as the ways of the path and its fruition are concerned, is that we ourselves act in ways that oppose our own development by merely wanting results without being interested in causes, that is, whether we are practicing rightly or wrongly. In truth, we should be adjusting and altering our actions of body, speech, and mind to make them conform to Tamma, which is the way of action leading to the path, fruition, and Nibbana. If we constantly examine and test ourselves against the standard of Tamma for the purpose of attaining whatever we have set our hearts on, we will at least succeed in attaining that purpose to our satisfaction, so long as our mindfulness and wisdom are strong enough. Whether in the time of the Lord Buddha or in our present age, the Kilesas must be corrected and got rid of by means of Tamma. It's comparable to diseases that have been prevalent in all ages. They can all be cured by using the right remedy. I have had faith in this for a long time, and the longer I go on practicing, the deeper it becomes buried in my heart, until nothing can remove it. Ajahn Mun's Ascetic Path Ajahn Kao always vividly remembered the words that Venerable Ajahn Mun spoke when they stayed together, for they had penetrated deep into his heart. His unshakable faith in Ajahn Mun grew deeper and deeper until it became one with his heart. Ajahn Mun taught him the true way of practice in this way. When watching the Kilesas and searching for Tamma, no one should overlook the heart, which is the place where the Kilesas and Tamma all dwell. Both the Kilesas and Tamma are to be found only in the heart, and not elsewhere in any time or place whatsoever. They arise in the heart, develop in the heart, and die away in the heart, which is the one who knows them. Trying to cure the Kilesas or search for Tamma in other places is useless. Even if you were to spend the rest of your life doing so, you would never come across them as they truly are. Even after dying and being reborn many times, you would still come across only Kilesas that have arisen from the heart and experience the discontent and suffering that comes from them. By searching for Tamma in the heart, you will gradually start to find it. It will then increase steadily, depending on the intensity with which you strive for it. Time and place are merely conditions which can promote or suppress the kilesas and tamma, causing them to develop or deteriorate accordingly. Thus, for instance, forms and sounds are conditions which promote the kilesas that are already in the heart, causing them to develop and increase. On the other hand, going to practice meditation in the hills and forests is done for the purpose of promoting the tamma that dwells in the heart, causing it to greatly increase. The real gilesas and tamma are within the heart, whereas the conditions that increase or suppress them are to be found everywhere, both internally and externally. That is why the Ajans teach their followers to avoid enticing things which are disturbing to the heart, things that tend to make those gilesas within their hearts become more audacious, such as the many things experienced through the senses. In addition, they also teach their followers to wander in mountains and forests, so they can live in peaceful solitude. There they can much more easily practice the way, and so gradually eliminate their kilesas, thus diminishing the round of birth and death, vatta, within their hearts by using these methods. For this reason, Finding a suitable place for the purpose of striving to practice the way is very important. It is the right method for one who is ordained and hopes to attain freedom from dukkha in his heart. This follows the basic principles of the Tamma that the Lord Buddha formulated for his followers after he saw clearly for himself what things were dangers to their purpose. By staying at times in ordinary places, and at other times in unusual and lonely places, your attitude towards the place where you are staying is always changing, so you don't become too complacent. But when you stay a long time in one place, the chitta becomes overly familiar with that place. 
Those who are reflective and watchful of themselves will know immediately when this happens, so they will quickly change and move to another place so as to find the right conditions to prevent themselves from relaxing to the point of carelessness. Complacency gives the Gilesas an opportunity to muster their strength and thus bring about your ruin without you being aware of what is happening. But when you correct the situation right away, without being careless or indifferent to it, the Gilesas are not likely to have any chance to build up enough strength to ruin the Chitta and the Tamma within it. You are then able to move forward without deteriorating. Those who train themselves to recognize what is dangerous must have mindfulness continually present in the heart, reflecting and knowing in the present without slipping away into forgetful indulgence. By not slipping into forgetful indulgence, you create a protective barrier against many kinds of gilesas which have not yet arisen, thus giving them no opportunity to arise. As for the gilesas that are still there, those that have yet to be entirely cured, it prevents them from becoming more troublesome and arrogant. It also encourages you to get rid of them using unrelenting mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and effort. If your mindfulness is strong, then any place which instills fear in the chitta becomes a charnel ground for the cremation of all the kilesas by means of tapa tamma, the ascetic tamma, that is, effort that has mindfulness and wisdom as the means of burning the kilesas to destruction. The chanas, samadhi, banya, wisdom, and vimutti, liberation, will all be absolutely clear to the heart in that place where you practice in the right way, whether it's the kilesas losing their power, or the kilesas dying away steadily, or the kilesas being entirely eliminated, it will happen in the heart, aided by a place which is well suited to someone who strives with zeal in everything in all ways. Other than the heart, there is no other place where all the kilesas arise and cease. This one must keep in mind and take to heart. The place where Tamma thrives is where the kilesas will decline and die away entirely. What we call the place, those who practice the way should always know is in the heart alone and nowhere else. Therefore you should struggle to cut the kilesas to pieces and destroy them without fear or favor on the battlefield, which is the heart, while depending on a suitable environment as a supporting condition to enable you to be victorious, to gain salvation, and to reach the highest point of human attainment by the persistence of your own striving. You must not go astray and be uncertain of the way, thinking that the kilesas and the great mass of your own dukkha are to be found anywhere else but within the sphere of the heart. From the first beginnings, my own practice, which was rather haphazard because I had no teacher who could teach and train me properly, until I became a teacher myself with my own followers, I have never seen this mass of dukkha anywhere but in the heart, nor have I seen any unimaginably strange or truly wonderful things in any other place except the heart, which is the abode of Tamma, and all the Gilesas as well. It is Dukkha and Samudaya, which also exist in the heart of each one of us, that exercise such great power over everything in the three worlds, for they are able to completely block the way which leads to the path, fruition, and Nibbana. Considering the means or tools for digging out and clearing away Dukkha and its cause, so that the path, fruition, and Nibbana may be clearly revealed, nothing in the three worlds is able to accomplish this better than Nirota and Magga, which also exist within the same heart. Just these four noble truths tell the whole story. You must not long for other times, places, or people, for this is a danger that wastes a lot of time and slows your development without being of any value at all. Thinking like this, rather than thinking about the Gilesas and Tamma within your heart, contradicts the purpose and aim of the great teacher, the Lord Buddha, who bestowed his Tamma teaching on the world, a teaching which is correct and suitable in all respects at all times. That, in essence, was the teaching which Venerable Adan Man taught Adan Kao in a fully reasoned way while Adan Kao was living with him in Chiang Mai province. Adan Kao always remembered it quite clearly, for it was buried in his heart with no room for doubt. Sometimes Adan Kao had questions which, when he asked them, 
Ajahn Mun would admonish him for casually asking questions without having first considered the principles of Tamma to see in which direction the truth lies. One such question he asked was, At the time of the Lord Buddha, according to his biography and other writings, large numbers of people attained the path, fruition, and Nibbana, and quickly as well. Far more people attained then than nowadays, for few people manage to get there now. Also, those who do attain seem to do so much slower. Venerable Adan Mun immediately asked him, How do you know that there are hardly any who attain the path, fruition, and Nibbana nowadays, and that those who do do so much more slowly? Adan Kao replied, Well, I have never heard of people attaining Nibbana like they used to in those days. According to what is written in the old books, many attain Nibbana simultaneously each time the Lord Buddha gave them a talk on Tamma, and many others did so soon afterward when they went out to practice the way on their own. It seems that they attained very quickly and easily, making it a joy to read about their attainments. But nowadays people strive until they almost die without seeing the type of results which one feels should come from such effort which causes those who practice to become discouraged and undermines their efforts. Venerable Ajahn Man then asked him, In the old books, does it say that all those who practiced the way in those days attained quickly and easily? Or were there also those who practiced the way with difficulty, some of them gaining understanding slowly and some quickly, as well as those who practiced the way easily, some gaining understanding slowly and some quickly? Such things depend on people's inherent levels of understanding and their basic temperaments, which vary greatly with different types of people. Adan Kao answered, saying, Yes, they did vary quite considerably, and they certainly did not all attain quickly and easily, some of whom attained slowly and some quickly, but I still feel that it was very different from the situation nowadays, even though people differed in the same way as they do now. Venerable Adan Mun then explained, this difference comes from the teachers and how correctly and precisely they can lead the way. There is also a great discrepancy between the power of the virtuous characteristics, vasana, of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas who follow the Buddha and that of people today. The difference is almost beyond comparison. In addition, the interest that people have in Tamma nowadays is so different from the time of the Lord Buddha. Even the characteristics of people that are derived from their background in this life are very different today from what they were back then. So when there are all these differences, it's hardly possible that the results will be the same. But there is no need for us to talk about other people of other ages, which would take a very long time and be tiresome. In ourselves, we display a coarseness that disturbs us all the time, even though we are ordained monks who believe that we strive diligently when we walk Jangama and sit in Samadhi Pawana. These, though, are just bodily activities. The heart, on the other hand, is not striving in any way that corresponds to these activities at all. All it does is think in ways that accumulate the gilesas and cause disturbance, while all along we believe that we are striving by means of these activities. When this is the case, the result is bound to disturb and trouble the heart regardless of when or where we are. Thus we conclude that although striving to our utmost, we have not gained the results we should. But in fact, while walking Jangama and sitting in Samadhi, we have been accumulating harmful poisons without our being in the least aware of it. This is how we fail to strive truly and properly as it should be done. So there is really no comparison between the time of the Lord Buddha, when their striving was genuine and truly concerned with gaining freedom from Dukkha, and this present age when we merely play like children with their toys. In fact, the more we try to make comparisons, the more we show off our gilesas and our incompetence. For myself, even though I live in this age of insincerity and deceit, I do not agree with you criticizing the Buddhist religion and yourself as you did just now. If you still see that you have some virtue and truth left within you, you should try to act in accordance with the plan of action that the Lord Buddha taught so rightly. Avoid the plan of action of the Gilesas that leads you along their way in everything you do all the time and every day, even while you believe that you are actually striving in the way of Tamma. The path, fruition, and Nibbana are universal treasures that the Lord Buddha said may be acquired by anybody. They are treasures that you will realize to your complete satisfaction one day for sure, so long as you do not keep thinking how difficult it is and how slow your attainment comes, which are nothing but obstacles in your way.
When we practice by striving like someone who feels, due to a weak, half-hearted resolve, that his body will break apart if he continues, we are like lazy, inconsequential fools who think they can bore a hole through a mountain using a small auger, and they are very anxious to do this within the time of a single day. It is so ludicrous that those who really do strive with sharp wisdom just laugh at it. We should consider the manner of striving of those who were sons of the Sakya, the Savaka disciples of the Buddha himself, to see how they acted, then compare them that with our own striving, which is like someone going to the shore just to smack the sea with his hand. It's enough to make one disheartened, seeing that his desire for Nibbana extends only to getting his hands wet. Think about how the Kilesas are like an ocean, and the efforts we make are like the water on our hands. How far apart are they? People in this age of just wetting their hands in the ocean make little in the way of effort, yet their intention is to get free from the realm of samsara. When this does not happen as they expect it to, they find some excuse to blame the religion or the time or the place and the people of this or that age. They are not in the least ashamed of the way they display their own incompetence and stupidity, which causes those Ajans who are truly wise and skilled to feel disheartened and to laugh wryly, saying that there is no way in which they can do anything about such people. To invest only a small amount of capital in a useless manner, and then to expect the most enormous returns on one's investment, is the way of an incompetent fool who builds his own charnel ground for cremating himself and remains engulfed in the flaming mass of his own dukkha. The round of Sangsara never weakens its hold on him, so he never has a chance to get free from it. The question that you asked me, which was in effect praising the teaching of Buddhism and praising the age, the place, and the people at the time of the Lord Buddha, while at the same time criticizing the teaching, the age, the place, and people nowadays, were the words of praise and blame of an incompetent fool who puts obstructions in his own path until he cannot find a way to crawl out to safety. It was the question of someone who is incompetent, the question of someone who puts thorns in his own path to obstruct himself. It was not a question designed to clear the way of obstacles so that you can move forward confidently with an interest in freeing yourself from the Kilesas by means of the Svaka Tathamma, the well-taught Tamma, which is the middle way that was given impartially to all those beings in the world who have enough interest to practice the way rightly. If you only had the mindfulness and wisdom to shed all these things from yourself, you would be worthy of some admiration. It's like various kinds of diseases which people get. If people take the right remedy to make them feel better, then the cure is likely to be effective. But if they are not interested in looking after themselves and treating the disease, it will probably get worse and could even become dangerous. Except for minor complaints, such as the common cold or minor skin troubles, that cure themselves without special attention. The Kilesa diseases, which are not in the class of self-healing minor ailments, must be treated with the right medicine. That medicine is the Thamma way of striving, following the pattern which the sons of the Sakya practiced. You can be fully confident that this remedy will quell and get rid of all the Kilesas, however strong they may be. If you were to think in this way, I could feel more at ease about you. I could admire you as someone who shows cleverness in his thinking, as someone who has confidence in his own ability to pass beyond the realm of samsara, as someone who has faith in the ability of the Lord Buddha and his religious teaching, faith that he penetrated Tamma with his intuitive ability and then spread it abroad as the Sasana Tamma in a proper manner, for his teaching was a Tamma of salvation, Niyanika Tamma, truly able to lead beyond beings to freedom. So don't blame and criticize yourself, saying that your kilesas are so thick that you can only learn tamma slowly, while at the same time having no interest in curing them. Don't blame the Lord Buddha, saying that he did not formulate and teach Thamma in a way that was equally suitable for his own time and for all other ages. Don't blame the Thamma, saying that it is incapable, or not penetrating enough, to cure the Gilesas of beings in this modern age in the way it did at the time of the Lord Buddha. I am not denying the fact that the strength of people's Gilesas is different from what it used to be, and I agree that people at the time of the Lord Buddha had far less of them than people do nowadays. The mode of teaching was also very different from what it is today, as were the teachers, who were mostly seers with great understanding and true seeing. The great teacher was the leader of the Savakas in formulating and teaching Tamma to his followers and others. Therefore the teaching was never wrong and never deviated from the truth, for it came straight from the heart of the Lord and from the hearts of his followers, which were completely purified. 
From this purity of heart they proclaimed the Tamma, teaching others in language that was fresh and direct, without anything hidden or anything mixed in that was wrong or distorted. Those who listened to this Tamma were intent on the truth. They fully committed themselves to it. So the situation was entirely suitable for both teacher and pupil, and so the results came, stage by stage. Being self-evident, they fulfilled the expectations of those people who were looking for truth. Because of that, they encountered no problems which could interfere with their development. It was for this reason that in those days, many people attained Magga and Pala each time the great teacher or his Savaka disciples gave Tamma teachings, whereas nowadays hardly anybody can attain. It's as though somehow people are no longer people, and Tamma is no longer Tamma, so no results come from the practice. But in fact, people are people, and Tamma is Tamma as they always were. But people are not interested in Tamma nowadays, so the Tamma that enters them does not reach the heart. As a result, people remain just people, and Tamma remains just Tamma, which is not likely to be of much use in bringing about the final attainment. Even if a large number of people listened to an exposition of the whole Tepetika, it would be merely like pouring water on a dog's back. The dog immediately shakes it all off until there is none left. In a similar way, the Tamma has no meaning in the hearts of people, much as water is of no consequence on the back of a dog. Venerable Ajahn Mun then asked Ajahn Kao, When you asked that question just now, was your heart like a dog's back? Or what was it like that you blindly placed blame only on the Tamma, saying that it had not brought you the results of the path fruition and Nibbana the same easy way it did in the time of the Lord Buddha? Why don't you think about your own heart, which is shaking off the Tamma from itself faster than a dog can shake water off its back? If you'll only reflect back and consider your own faults and failings, some Tamma may find a place to seep into your heart and remain there. Then it won't simply flow through it like water flowing down a channel without any reservoir to store it, which is how you are at present. The nature of people's gilezas at the time of the Lord Buddha was a matter of their own virtue and merit, a fact which should not affect us or make difficulties for us nowadays. People today have their own gilezas of various kinds which create trouble for them until there is hardly anywhere in the world where they can live normally. If people don't have enough interest in curing their kilesas so that they gain some freedom from the fire with which they burn each other by always criticizing one another, then it won't matter at all what age they live in. The same holds true for those who have no interest in directing their criticisms towards themselves, towards the one who is creating the fire to burn himself and cause all sorts of troubles to others now, in the present. Turning criticism towards yourself is a way of exorcising the fires of lust, hate, and delusion, at least to the extent of finding a way to gain some degree of calm and happiness so that you are not roasted by these fires beyond your endurance. This is the way it should be with human beings, who are far more clever than any other species in the world. Ajahn Kao later explained the effect that Venerable Ajahn Mun's forceful admonitions had on him. Venerable Ajahn Mun used to scold me quite fiercely for asking questions which had no practical solution, although I didn't ask such questions very often. But when Venerable Ajahn Mun responded to these questions by treating them as if they were thorns and splinters obstructing the sasana, I felt that it forced me to see my own faults. I would feel uneasy about it for many days, even though I actually had no doubt that people nowadays could practice tamma. But Adan Mun would still scold me, shredding me with his fierce language, which I reckon was right and suitable for someone like me who was always talking and so couldn't be quiet and contented. On the other hand, it was also quite beneficial because I was able to hear a Tamma teaching that went straight to my heart. Actually, what I have just told you is no more than a fraction of the deep, spirited, and fiery Tamma which he delivered. For his tamma was deeper than the ocean and more fiery than the fires of hell. He also brought up the questions I had asked him in the past to stir me up time after time. Sometimes he did this right in the middle of a meeting when all the other bhikkhus were gathered there to hear him speak. He would reveal my evil ways, talking about my wrong views, mitsa dirti, and likening me to a devadatta destroying the sasana. He would tear me into pieces until there was nothing good left, going on like that for a long time without letting up, until some of the other bhikkhus began to wonder about it. 
Afterwards, they would come to ask me whether what Adan Mun said was true. I had to explain how the questions I asked were not a true indication of my attitude, but that it was just a method of getting him to speak about Tamma. Normally, if nobody asked him strange and unusual questions, he did not speak Tamma like that. But I suppose I was rather stupid in my choice of questions, for I jumped in with both feet and gave him the hammer to hit me. Maybe I should have asked more normal and less inflammatory questions, so that I could listen to Tamma that was more sweet and soothing. Generally speaking, it was as Ajahn Kao said. When Venerable Ajahn Mun was asked questions that were not in any way strange or unusual, he simply answered in a normal way. Even though it was still Tamma, his way of speaking was smooth and normal, so it made no lasting impression on one's heart. But when asked a strange, unusual question, he became quite animated, and the import of the Tamma which he brought forth was truly satisfying, as was already described in the biography of Venerable Ajahn Mun. In truth, Ajahn Mun had no doubts about Ajahn Kao's views, although the way he scolded him made it appear as though he was doubtful. It was merely the way of a skilled Ajahn teaching Tamma. He often changed his attitude and his style of teaching in order to arouse those who were listening, making them ponder his teachings in a way that they would remember for a long time. Otherwise, they might remain complacent, clinging to their own stupidity with no interest in thinking about anything, like a frog sitting and looking at a lotus flower without any purpose. But as soon as a John Mun rapped them on the head with his knuckles, it was as though their ears and eyes became brighter. Those Tutanga Kamatana Bhikkhus who followed Venerable Ajahn Mun liked being stirred up and rapped on the head frequently to hold their attention and make them think. When he simply talked in a smooth and even manner, they would listen quiescently, there being nothing to arouse and catch the heart to make it excited, concerned, and a bit frightened. Their hearts then tended to go to sleep internally when there was no method capable of making their minds active and thoughtful. Then those kilesas that were waiting to take over were likely to find an opportunity to escape and go about distracting their attention and causing trouble, because the method of teaching was not equal to the ability of the kilesas. But when they received an unusual form of teaching from Venerable Ajahn Mun, as when he was asked a question that warranted such a way of teaching, their mindfulness and wisdom were stirred up and became brighter and sharper. So, although Adan Kao was partly right and partly wrong in asking Venerable Ajahn Man questions, they were Tamma questions from which he could expect to gain a lot of value in the same way he had often done in the past. <clears throat> Tamma Principles in the Heart The first year that Adan Kao spent the Vasa period with Venerable Ajahn Man in the Chiang Mai region, an indescribable enthusiasm and joy arose in his heart. This opportunity was a just reward for the several years he had followed Ajahn Man, when he had heard his teaching at times in various places, but was only allowed to stay with him for brief periods, which was not truly satisfying. During those early years, he would be driven away by Ajahn Mun after a short time, and told he must live in a separate location. Finally, he was fortunate enough to have Ajahn Mun give him the opportunity to join him for a Vasa period. This made him so happy that he increased his striving greatly, until he was hardly taking any sleep at all, sometimes spending the whole night striving at his meditation practice. Then one night his chitta became fully integrated, dropping down into a state of calm where it had a complete rest for some time before withdrawing to normal consciousness. He was filled with wonder at the brightness of his heart, which went beyond anything he had ever experienced before. It caused him to become completely absorbed in tamma until the light of dawn appeared. That night he did not sleep at all. In the morning he got up at the usual time and went about his duties, helping to clean and arrange things at Ajahn Man's hut and taking his bowl, robes, and other things to the place where he ate food in the sala. When Ajahn Man came from the place where he did his meditation practice, it seemed that he watched Ajahn Kao unusually closely. Ajahn Kao himself noticed this and felt very self-conscious, afraid that he may have done something wrong. After a short while, Venerable Ajahn asked him, how is your meditation practice going now? Last night your chitta was much brighter than it has been at any time since you came to stay with me. 
This is how you must do it. This is the right way for one who searches for Thamma. Do you understand where Thamma is now? Last night, where was that brightness? He answered, The brightness was in my heart, sir. But he felt afraid and embarrassed until he almost started shivering, for he had never before been praised and asked a question at the same time like this. Venerable Ajahn Man then asked him, Where was the Tamma before this that you could not see it? You have now seen Tamma. From now on, you must always know that Tamma is in the heart. In the future, you must maintain well the level of your chitta and the level of your efforts in meditation. You must not let them deteriorate. This is the ground of the chitta, the ground of the tamma, the ground of your faith in tamma, and the ground of the path, fruition, and nibbana. All of them are just there. You must be confident and resolute in your striving if you want to transcend dukkha. You have got to make the effort just there, in the heart. You can be absolutely certain that nowhere else but just this one place you can get free from dukkha. You must not grope around blindly in your practice, for you are no longer blind, so there is no need to do so. Last night I sent the flow of my chitta out to look at you, and I saw your chitta brightly illuminating everything around you. Throughout the night, every time I sent my chitta out to look, it was the same way. I did not get any sleep last night either. Part of the time I spent in Samadhi Pawana, part of the time I was receiving Deva guests, and part of the time I was sending out my chitta to see how you were getting on. It went on like this until dawn, without having any sense of time. As soon as I came out of Pawana, I had to ask you about it, because I have always wanted to know about my fellows in Tamma. Was it peaceful? Was it blissful that time? Not daring to answer Ajahn Mun, Ajahn Kao remained silent. He felt that Ajahn Mun had already looked right through him and could see his lungs and liver and everything else. So what would be the use of telling him? From then on, he was much more afraid of Ajahn Mun and much more careful where he was concerned. Even prior to that, he was quite sure that Ajahn Mun could know the minds and hearts of people as he wished, but that day he experienced it for himself, which made him that much more certain. So he became very afraid of him in a way that's hard to describe. From that day on, he was able to firmly fix the state of his heart and develop it steadily, more and more, bit by bit, without any decline or backsliding at all. Adan Mun used to goad him quite frequently. Any sign of self-indulgence and he would be scolded immediately. Adan Mun tended to become fierce and scold him much more quickly than before. His frequent exhortations and reminders were actually methods of helping Adan Kao to look after his chitta and to maintain his level of tamma, for they made him more afraid of backsliding in his meditation. From that time on, he continued to spend the Vasa period with Adan Mun each year. After each Vasa, he went out wandering in order to practice the way in places where he found it to be suitable for striving. Ajahn Mun would also go off wandering, but in a different direction so as to be on his own. He did not like wandering in the company of other bhikkhus. So the bhikkhus all went out in different directions, each as he felt inclined. But whenever some internal problem arose in their hearts, they would make for Ajahn Mun in order to ask for his advice. Each time he would explain the answer and clear up the problem. Venerable Adan Kao's effort in meditation continued to progress steadily. His mindfulness and wisdom gradually spread and branched out until they were infused into the heart so that they became one and the same with the heart. Whatever his bodily posture or activity, he maintained his effort with mindfulness and wisdom present at all times. His heart was bold and courageous. It had lost all fear of those things which arouse and maintain the thoughts and emotional states aramna, that used to be his enemies. He was also certain of the path leading to freedom from Dukkha. He had no doubts about it, even though he had yet to actually attain complete freedom. The Tamma Remedy When Venerable Ajahn Kao became ill while he was living in the forests and hills, he was never much concerned about finding medicines to cure himself. He tended to rely upon the Tamma Remedy, much more than any other method, 
for it was effective both for the body and for the chitta at the same time. He would grasp the problem, fix his attention on it, and reflect upon it for a long time, much longer than normal. Many times he managed to overcome fevers by this type of treatment, until he became quite confident of this technique of reflective investigation whenever he felt ill. It started from the time his chitta attained samadhi, when his heart became calm and cool. Whenever he had a fever, he would set up a determination to fight it unwaveringly by meditating with a completely resolute heart, a method that had always brought him clearly visible results. At first, when he had a fever, he relied upon Venerable Ajahn Mun to guide him in the correct method. Ajahn Mun told him that whenever his own heart had gained unusually great strength, it nearly always came during times of severe sickness and pain. The more painful the sickness was, the more easily mindfulness and wisdom spun round and round the body, quickly going to each and every aspect of the illness as it happened. There was no need for him to compel himself to look into the body at that time. He had no interest at all in whether he got better or not. His only concern was to strive to know the truth of all the painful feelings as they arose and swooped down on him at that time, using the mindfulness and wisdom that he had developed to expertise by continuous training. Sometimes Venerable Adan Mun went to talk with Ajahn Kao when he had a fever. He tried to make him think by asking a pointed question saying, Have you ever thought how in your past lives you experienced pain and suffering much more acute than this, just prior to the time you died? Even ordinary people in the world who have learnt nothing of tamma can put up with the suffering of an ordinary fever. Some of them even retain good mindfulness and seemly behavior, better than many bhikkhus. They do not groan and moan and restlessly move around, flinging their arms about while twisting and writhing, like some unworthy bhikkhus who, really speaking, should not be Buddhists at all. Bhikkhus should never put themselves in a position where they tarnish the religion of the Buddha. Even though experiencing great pain and suffering, some lay people have enough mindfulness to control their manners so that they are seemly and respectable, which is quite admirable. I once saw a sick layman whose children asked me to visit him as he was beyond hope of recovery. They said that their father wanted to meet me and pay his last respects to me, giving him something to keep in mind and to raise up his heart when he came to the time of his death. When I arrived at the house, no sooner had their father seen me walking up to the place where he was lying down than he managed somehow to quickly sit up by himself, his face beaming and happy. He managed this in spite of his illness, and in spite of the fact that normally he could not sit up without assistance. Actually, at that moment, all symptoms of his illness had disappeared, though there were enough indications left to show that he was quite seriously ill. He bowed down and paid homage with cheerfulness and joy in his heart, his manners and general behavior being seemly and beautiful, which startled and perplexed everyone else in his home. They all wondered, how could he get up by himself? Normally to move a little bit to a new position while lying prostrate we have to help him all the way with great care, fearing that otherwise he may be hurt or perhaps die right then. But as soon as he saw you coming, Venerable Ajahn, he got up like a new person, not like one who is about to die any time. They were amazed, for they had never seen anything like it before. Later they came to tell me that he died shortly after I left him. He was fully conscious right up to the last moment, and he seemed to die peacefully, as though he had reached some state of happiness. As for you, your illness is not as severe as that man's, so why are you so careless and unmindful about examining and investigating your situation? Or is it your laziness that weighs your heart down and makes your body weak and flabby? If many Gamertana bhikkhus act like this, people will criticize the way of Buddhism. The way of Gamertana will fall apart because none of the bhikkhus can put up with difficulties since they are all too weak and flabby. Their Gamertana is also weak and flabby, so they are just waiting on the chopping block for the Gilesas to come and chop them up and make a salad of them. The Lord Buddha did not proclaim the teaching of mindfulness and wisdom for lazy, weak, and flabby people who merely look at their sickness without thinking, searching, and investigating in terms of tamma. The death of such a weak and lazy person would be of no consequence. In fact, it's no more worthy than the death of a rat. 
Don't bring the attitude of a pig waiting casually on the chopping block into the sasana in the circle of Gumbatana bhikkhus. It makes me feel ashamed in the face of those lay people who are more worthy than such bhikkhus. I even feel ashamed in the face of the rats that die peacefully because they are better than bhikkhus who become weak and lazy when they have a fever and then die without any mindfulness and wisdom to look after themselves. You should try doing some investigation to see whether the tamma truths, such as the truth of dukkha, are really true or not. How true are they and where is their truth to be found? Does the truth dwell in the carelessness, weakness, and laziness that you are promoting at present? These tendencies are just promoting the cause of dukkha so that it accumulates in the heart, making you stupid and preventing you from rising out of it. It is not the way of the path, which leads one entirely to the cessation of dukkha. I boldly proclaim that I have gained strength of heart at times of severe sickness by examining the dukkha that arose within me. I saw clearly the place where it arose and established itself, along with its dying away and ceasing by means of true mindfulness and wisdom. The chitta that knows the truth of dukkha becomes calm and peaceful. It does not go about looking for something to change its state. Instead, being one and single, it remains firmly within the truth. There there is nothing in the chitta to cause trouble or unseemly actions, nor can anything false enter to cause doubt or uncertainty. At that point, painful feelings either cease completely or, even if they remain, they are quite unable to overwhelm the chitta. The chitta and the pain are both true, each in its own sphere. This is where the tamma truths become the highest truths. You must stay focused in the chitta as you thoroughly investigate everything. Mindfulness and wisdom become active because you investigate, not because you're too lazy to make use of the very tools that are capable of countering the kilesas. Here is a simile to help you understand. If you take a stone and throw it at someone's head, it can cause injury or maybe even kill him. But you can also make valuable use of that stone for sharpening knives or other purposes. Accordingly, a fool uses a stone to do damage, whereas a clever person uses it for good purposes to help himself in desirable ways. Mindfulness and wisdom are like this. They can be used wrongly to think out ways of doing things that are morally bad, such as being clever in a deceitful way in one's business affairs, or clever in robbery and banditry, or being slick and quicker than a monkey so that others cannot follow what one is up to. All actions that usually turn into evil because of using mindfulness and wisdom in the wrong way. But we can also use mindfulness and wisdom in the right way in our livelihood, by using them in such things as building work or carpentry or writing, or the various kinds of repair work in which we are skilled. Or we may use them to cure our gilesas and tanha, which fix us firmly to the wheel of samsara and lead us to endless rounds of birth and death until they have all been removed from the heart. Then we become purified and reach the state of freedom, Nibbana. It may happen today, or this month, or this year, or in this lifetime, for it is not beyond the ability of human beings to attain this, as we can see from the examples of those clever people who have done so from the time of the Lord Buddha up to the present day. Wisdom brings endless benefits to those who have enough interest and incentive to use contemplative thought without fixing any bounds or limits to it. Mindfulness and wisdom have never deceived people by leading them into a state of despair with no way out. So we need not be afraid that we'll develop too much mindfulness and wisdom, or that they will turn us into someone who is good at breaking up and destroying whatever tamma we have within us. We need not fear that an abundance of mindfulness and wisdom will hinder our chances of attaining freedom by overwhelming us before we're even halfway there. Since ancient times, the wisest of people have always praised mindfulness and wisdom, saying that they are the most exalted faculties and never out of date. You should therefore think and search digging up mindfulness and wisdom and promoting them as the best means of defending yourself and the best method of completely destroying the enemy within you. Then you will see a most excellent and precious sphere of the heart that has always been there within you since endless ages past. This tamma that I am teaching to you comes entirely from the tamma that I have experienced directly as a result of investigating it thoroughly. It is not based on guesswork, like scratching without being able to locate the itch, for what I teach comes from what I have known and experienced with certainty. 
those who want to get free from dukkha, yet are afraid of the dukkha that arises within them and so refuse to investigate it, will never be able to get free from dukkha. The way to Nibbana depends on the truth of dukkha and the cause of dukkha as the means of going forward on the path. The Lord Buddha and every one of the Savaka Arahants attained the fulfillment of the path fruition and Nibbana by means of the four noble truths. Not one of them failed to pass completely through these noble truths. At this time, some of these noble truths are quite clearly and openly displaying their true nature within your body and mind. You must investigate these truths, using mindfulness and wisdom to get to really know them clearly. You must not sit back and merely gaze at them, or you will become an invalid in the area of these Tamma truths, which have always been true since the beginning of the world. If we Tutanga Kamartana Bhikkhus cannot face the truth that is displaying itself so clearly to us, who else will ever be able to face up to it and know it? Those in Kamartana circles are closer and more intimate with the Tamma truths than anyone else, so they should be able to realize their true nature before others do. Although others outside the circle of Gamartana also have the Tamma truths as an inherent part of the body and mind, they differ in that they avoid doing any investigation which would lead them to understand them in a different way. This is because their position as lay people affords them less of an opportunity to pursue these practices. But the Tutanga Gamartana Bhikkhu is a special case for he is fully prepared to progress steadily towards realizing the truth which is apparent within him all the time. If you have the blood of a warrior who is truly worthy of the name given by the great teacher, Sakya Buddha Buddha Jnorasa, son of the Sakya, the victorious Buddha, you must try to investigate so as to realize the truth clearly. Right now, the truth about painful feeling is announcing its presence within your body and mind in a clear and unmistakable manner. Don't let the opportunity presented to you by this pain pass by uselessly. Instead, I want you to extract the truth from that painful feeling and bring it up for mindfulness and wisdom to analyze. Then mark it well so that it makes an indelible impression on your heart. From then on, it will act as an example to show that you have now gained a clear understanding of this first of the four truths that the Lord Buddha proclaimed throughout his teaching, namely the truth of Dukkha. You will have gained this understanding by means of your mindfulness and wisdom in a way that leaves no room for doubt. This will happen as you endeavor to make knowledge of that truth steadily develop, thus increasing your understanding until every bit of doubt has disappeared. If you strive to do what I have just taught you, then although the fever in your body increases, you yourself will appear to be perfectly well and fit. In other words, your heart won't be disturbed by or apprehensive of the pain arising in your body. Instead, you will take pride and satisfaction from what you have realized in a calm, steady manner. You will not display any outward symptoms, restlessly moving and changing about as the fever gets worse. This is what's meant by learning Tamma for the truth. The wisest people have all learnt it in this way. They do not wishfully imagine the types of feelings they would like to have, thinking how they would prefer this or that kind of feeling according to their desires, all of which merely accumulates the cause of Dukkha, thus making it increase and grow much stronger. You must take this teaching to heart and remember it well. You must continue investigating to find the meaning of Tamma, which is the truth that is within yourself. This knowledge is well within each and every person's capability. I am merely the one who teaches the way to do it. Whether the pupil is fearless and valiant or weak and flabby depends entirely on the person who does the investigation. No one else has a say in that at all. Well now. It's time for you to live up to your teacher's expectations. Don't just lie there like a foot-wiping rag, letting the kilesas come to stomp all over you and beat you out flat. This would be disastrous and bring nothing but trouble in the future. Don't say I haven't warned you. Venerable Ajahn Kao recalled that, when Venerable Ajahn Mun gave me this Tamma talk, it was as though a violent storm had passed through and then disappeared. I was so moved by his skillful, penetrating teaching that I felt 
I would float up into the air with rapture and joy. Nothing else could have been so valuable to me at that time. As soon as Ajahn Mun left, I began practicing the methods in which he had so kindly instructed me. I began to the best of my ability to examine and unravel the problem of the painful feelings I was experiencing then, without exhibiting any form of weakness at all. While doing the investigation of pain after Ajahn Mun left, it felt as if he were still sitting there with me, watching me and waiting to help show me how to do it the whole time. More than that, the feeling of his presence gave me strength of heart to increase my fight with painful feeling. While doing the investigation, I tried to separate Dukkha out from the Kantas. In other words, the body and all its parts I put into one heap, Kanta. Sanya, memory, which stands by to define or determine, thereby deceiving us, I divide it into a second heap. Sankara, which is thinking and imagining, I put into a third heap. And the Chitta I put separately into a special category. Then I investigated, I compared, I looked for causes and results from the arising and ceasing of the chaotic jumble of pain that was racking my body. But I did not think about whether the pain would die away and I would survive, or whether it would get worse and I would die, for I was absolutely determined to get to know the truth of all these things. In particular, I wanted to find out what in fact the truth of Dukkha was. Why should it have such power that it can shake up and disturb the hearts of all beings throughout the world without exception? This happens when Dukkha arises in normal circumstances due to all sorts of different causes. More so, it arises when people reach the end of their lives and are just about to leave this life and go to a new state. All sentient beings of every kind feel very frightened at that time. None of them are bold and fearless enough to face up to death and accept it, except when they are forced to face it because there's no other alternative, no way out. If there was any way to avoid it, they would escape to the other end of the world if necessary to get away from it, all because of the fear of death. After Ajahn Mun left, I thought to myself, I am also one of these sentient beings who are timid and frightened of Dukkha. So what should I do about the Dukkha I'm now experiencing in order that I may be bold and fearless with the truth as my witness? Well, I must contend with Dukkha by using mindfulness and wisdom to follow the methods taught by the great teacher, and my own teacher as well. A short time ago, Venerable Ajahn Mun kindly taught me in a way that went straight to my heart, leaving no room for doubt. He taught me that I should fight using mindfulness and wisdom to separate and analyze these khandhas, examining to see them quite clearly. Right now, what khandha is this painful feeling? Can it be the body, or memory, or thought and imagination, or consciousness, or the chitta? If it cannot be any of those, then why do I make out that the painful feeling is me, that I am in pain, that pain is truly mine? Am I really this painful feeling or what? I must find out the truth of this today, so if the pain does not stop and I have not come to know this painful feeling quite clearly with true mindfulness and wisdom, I shall go on sitting here in meditation until I die if necessary. But I will definitely not get up from this place just to let the pain mock and ridicule me. From that moment on, mindfulness and wisdom began aggressively analyzing as if it were a matter of life and death. This life and death struggle between the chitta and the pain went on for five hours. Following that, I knew the truth about each one of the kantas on its own. But in particular, I knew the feeling group most clearly by means of wisdom. As soon as the investigation had thoroughly and completely penetrated every aspect of the kantas, the painful feelings died away immediately. From then on, an unshakable faith in the validity of the noble truths arose in me, based upon the truth of Dukkha. I then knew the truth of it without any doubt or uncertainty. From that day forward, whenever I got a fever or any other sickness, my heart was able to be victorious by practicing the way of mindfulness and wisdom. Never again was I weak and spineless in the face of pain. Instead, my heart gained strength in times of pain and sickness, which are times of serious concern, maybe even matters of life and death. 
The Tamma which I, like most ordinary people not faced with a critical situation, had never taken very seriously, then displayed the truth for me to see clearly as I thoroughly investigated painful feeling. The pain then ceased and the heart became concentrated and went down and reached the base of Samadhi. All doubts and problems with regard to the body and mind then ceased while they went quiescent. This lasted until the chitta withdrew from that state, which took several hours. Whatever else needed to be investigated would be dealt with in the future with fearless regard for the truth which had already been seen. When Ajahn Kao's chitta became concentrated and dropped down to reach the basis of Samadhi due to the powerful influence of the investigation, the fever ceased immediately and did not return again. He said that it was quite extraordinary how this could happen. In regard to this, the author believes what Ajahn Kao said without question, because I have also done such investigations in a similar manner and have experienced the same kind of results. So I feel fully confident that the Tamma remedy is quite capable of treating sickness in subtle and strange ways, and I appreciate those meditators who have tendencies of character in this direction. Most of the Tutanga Kamartana bhikkhus like to do such investigations as a remedy for their own body and mind when they become seriously ill with painful fevers. But they like doing it quietly on their own, and they don't readily tell other people about it, except their friends who are also doing the practice in the same way and who have similar characters. With them, they can talk intimately about these things. It must be understood, however, that the aforementioned practice of curing diseases by using meditation should not be taken to mean that all diseases can be cured by such methods. Even the bhikkhus who practice them are by no means sure which diseases can be cured in this way and which cannot. But regardless of what happens, they are never indifferent or neglectful about the changes taking place within them. Even when it happens that the body is going to die due to a disease, they must also use the power of the tamma remedy to make sure that some of the diseases of the chitta, meaning some of the gilesas and asavas, die at the same time. They are therefore relentless in their investigations into the various diseases that arise, both in the body and in the chitta. They believe it to be an important and necessary duty in connection with the kantas and the chitta which they must investigate and accept responsibility for right up to the last moment. Venerable Ajahn Kao invariably preferred to cure fevers and illnesses by using the Tamma remedy. At one time he was staying in a hilly part of Sakon Nakon province, which at that time was infested with malaria. One day after he had finished eating his food, he immediately began to feel feverish and shivery. He wrapped himself in several blankets to keep warm, but to no avail. He looked about for a warm place, but it was hopeless, so he gave up trying to treat the problem by external means. He decided instead to treat it internally by means of tamma, which he had already done successfully in the past. He told the other bhikkhus who were with him to go away and leave him alone. They were to wait until they saw that he had opened the door of his hut before coming to see him again. After all the bhikkhus had gone, he began to meditate by investigating painful feelings in the same way as he had done before. He started about nine o'clock in the morning and went on until three o'clock in the afternoon before he was finally successful. The fever died away and he was cured. At the same time, his chitta became concentrated and dropped down until it reached its natural level, where it rested for about two hours. Finally, at about six o'clock in the evening, he left the place where he had been practicing samadhi meditation, feeling a buoyancy of body and heart without anything left to cause him trouble. The fever had completely gone, and his chitta had become bright and skilled with wisdom, standing out prominently within himself. He has lived with the Vihara Tamma ever since then. locked in spiritual combat. While Ajahn Kao was spending the Vasa at Wat Ba Ban Buang, 
Sun Mahapon district in Chiang Mai province. He accelerated his efforts in meditation round the clock in every posture and activity, much more so than in his previous Vasa periods. In previous years, he had worked very hard as well, but this Vasa, he made a special effort beyond what he had done before. He did this by maintaining his effort in the three postures of standing, walking and sitting, without lying down at all. If he slept at all, he did so in the sitting position he used when doing Samadhi Pavana, and only then when his body and mind had reached the limit of their ability to go without sleep, which was a time when his mindfulness was at a low ebb. But he refused to let himself give up working so as to lie down and sleep, as he used to when he indulged in the fourth posture of lying down. This was because he clearly saw good results in both samadhi and wisdom. He saw how his heart was more intimately calm and his wisdom was more subtle, penetrating and proficient than when he was striving in the way he had been practicing before. This gave him encouragement in his effort to maintain the practice and the three postures throughout the vasa without letting his body slouch or assume a posture that would incline towards lying down to sleep. If we use the language of a warrior, he was locked in combat, fighting to win or lose against the Kilesas, which like to think only of a comfortable bed and pillow. If they had their way, he would lie down and give in completely, laid out flat at full length like a snake, together with his faith, effort, mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom. So he determined that those Gilesas which drag the bhikkhu down onto the sleeping mat must put up with fasting, bhikkhu meat is tasty for the Gilesas, and emaciation for those three months of the Vasa period. Then those five Tamma results would get a chance to walk along the path of the Lord Buddha. Practicing in that way, he could sense imminent victory coming from his struggle to fight in all three postures, as though he were on the verge of attaining tamma in each posture. This added increased enthusiasm to his efforts. His body and heart became light and buoyant due to the various kinds of tamma he developed, and his striving became easier as it shifted back and forth, fighting against the kilesas. He was not concerned about the difficulties he faced in fighting the kilesas, which he realized deep in his heart were his enemies. One night, while he was sitting in Samadhi Pavana, his chitta dropped down into a subtle state of calm and reached the ground of Samadhi. It remained there resting for a long time, before withdrawing to the level of Upadara Samadhi, where a nimitta arose in his chitta and he saw the whole earth whirling round like a wheel. The more closely he examined that nimitta, the faster it went round as though the earth and sky were about to collapse. He felt as though he was floating just above the ground and moving along parallel with the earth, though he wasn't actually walking. In the Namitta it seemed that his body was floating along the Chankama path he normally used. It floated back and forth many times before it stopped. As soon as it stopped, a light appeared. It seemed to shine down from the sky above and enter into his heart, enabling him to see all the parts within his body quite clearly. He became engrossed in examining the various parts within his body, contemplating them in terms of the basis for the seeing of their loathsomeness, asubhakamatana, and in terms of the three characteristics, de lakana, and the heart was joyful and bright with wisdom, faith, and fearless determination. He discovered many skillful ways and methods for extracting various kinds of kilesas, methods that came to him continually throughout that retreat period. During that vasa he practiced with great energy and enthusiasm, and he understood things very clearly. He experienced none of the somber moods that had troubled him often in the past. Instead, there was a firm resolve in the direction of samadhi, and a clever skillfulness and nimbleness in the direction of mindfulness and wisdom, those two friends of a heart that striving relentlessly in every posture. At that level, the relationship between mindfulness and wisdom and the chitta, which is known as automatic striving, began to appear quite clearly within the chitta. Then in all postures the chitta kept up a constant effort all the time, excepting only when he slept. There was no longer a need to force mindfulness and wisdom to work like there had been in the past when he was forced to push them to strive all the time. 
Previously, if he had not done so, the Kilesas would have forced him onto the chopping block where he would never have been able to stand against them. At earlier stages of his training, his Kilesas were much more active, quick and penetrating than his mindfulness, wisdom and effort were. We should never pride ourselves on being really clever and skilled when the chitta is merely at the level of samadhi or calmness. Although the chitta is calm, it is still subject to the seductive temptations of the gilesas, which cause it to become addicted to samadhi and so lose all interest in investigating with wisdom, which is the way to extract the gilesas and get rid of them from the heart. When the time comes that wisdom moves out to do the work of confronting and fighting the various Gelesas, it steadily succeeds in defeating them, rarely finding that it is at a loss, not knowing what to do. We steadily get to know the various alluring enticements of the Gelesas, how they appear so harmoniously beautiful and melodious that we become overwhelmed by their lingering appeal. This is why all beings in the world never tire of the various enticements used by the Gilesas. This despite the fact that they tempt beings over and over again to love and to hate and to be so angry or greedy as to cause beings great difficulty because they have to put up with so much suffering and torment. However many hundreds or thousands or millions of times people do this, still they are never fed up or satiated with it, nor do they see the harmfulness of these enticements at all. If they do see the harm in them, it comes only in a flash when they are experiencing so much suffering and torment that they are truly in a corner with no way out. But almost immediately the allure of the Gilesas returns and puts them into a dozing sleep. From then on, the day never comes when anything arouses them enough to see the harmfulness of it. The effort that begins arising at this level of practice is an aggressive kind of effort which fights the Gilesas, repeatedly striking at them in many different ways so as to beat up and kill off more and more of them. This kind of effort is in no way at a loss, because it is not lulled into a drunken stupor by the Gilesas. It does not look on them as friends and allies and so submit to them in life and death, as was the case before the Tamma weapons of mindfulness and wisdom were powerful enough to overwhelm them. At the stage that Adan Kao had reached, all of his Tamma weapons were becoming very powerful as they shone forth brightly. They really enjoyed digging up the Gilesas, pulling them out, and tearing them to pieces quite ruthlessly. It seems that the firmness of his intention to gain that realm where there is freedom from Dukkha steadily gained strength until his striving reached a point of urgency, where the practice was a matter of life and death. Whatever was good would remain. Whatever was bad must be destroyed without any regrets. Birth and death are barbs and thorns which the Kilesas always stab into the heart, where they have been the ruling power for countless ages. But they were no longer allowed to have any power to rule, for from then on it was to be the supremely excellent pure Tamma which alone had power to rule over the heart. Tamma now ruled the heart where Ajahn Kao previously let the Gilesas and the Wheel of Sangsara rule. Instead of Tamma being driven away and losing out to the Gilesas every time, he refused to have the Gilesas in his heart any more. After that Vasa period, he left that place to go wandering in the Kamatana way, wherever he felt like going. He went to stay near a forest village in Chiang Mai province, where a small hut had been built. In the past, Thutanga Kamatana bhikkhus had stayed there to work at their practice, but now it was abandoned. It was a very peaceful and quiet place, far away from the village, so he stayed there to develop his practice. One day it started raining heavily in the middle of the day so he could not go out to walk Jangama. He closed the door, the windows, and the hinged wall, and he sat in Pawana on the floor of the hut, which was raised well above the ground. While he was sitting doing meditation, it seemed to him that a red-hot burning pipe had been stuck into his butt. It stopped for a while, and then came up again, so he turned to investigate what it was all about. As soon as his chitta turned to focus on the cause of the hot pipe which was burning him, he realized that the fire was actually the heat of sexual desire appearing from beneath his hut. He knew that it did not come from his own heart. 
he checked his investigation thoroughly and confirmed that it was in fact the fire of Ragatanha coming from underneath his hut, for in his own chitta there was absolutely no sign of Ragatanha at all. The whole time he was engaged in investigating this fire, he never paused to wonder where this fire came from. He was merely reflecting internally, trying to work it out in his heart. How has this blaze of Raga been able to cling on to me? I have no fixed attachment to or desire for any man or woman, so my heart is normal. No Raga has arisen in it. Every day when he went to Bindabada in the village, he went fully self-controlled, having mindfulness present to watch cautiously every aspect and phase of all those emotional biases which had been enemies of the Chitta. His heart could never find any aspect of Ragatanha that could be an emotional bias. When that fire had calmed down and no longer showed itself, he opened his eyes and rose from his meditation seat, by which time the rain had stopped. Looking behind him, he saw a woman come out from under his hut and walk away. This made him connect the fire that had burnt him with the woman who was just then walking away from under his hut. He realized then that the woman probably had bad thoughts about him, which caused that incident to happen. It's something that he would never have imagined possible. Actually, that woman was quite young, about 25 years old, and most likely unmarried. She was probably out gathering edible plants or firewood, for she was carrying a basket. As she approached his hut, it started to rain heavily, so she quickly took shelter under the hut until the rain stopped, after which she came out and walked away. When a John Cow looked out the window, which was covered by a straw mat with many gaps in it, he could see the woman quite clearly. When telling this story to the bhikkhus and novices on suitable occasions, Ajahn Kao never implied that he was blaming or criticizing the woman at all. He simply used the story of this woman as an example to explain to them about the flow of the chitta. Whether focused externally or internally, it is something so subtle that we are normally unaware of it. It is only the process of investigation in the manner of the practice of jitta pavana that enables us to gradually come to know such things. He said that his chitta was in a very subtle state at that time, and his mindfulness and wisdom were fast enough to keep up with such happenings. They were not as slow as they used to be when he first started to train himself, so when the raga within his chitta suddenly became active, his mindfulness kept up with it, but his wisdom was still not able to cut it off at that stage. Later on, the ability of mindfulness and wisdom that he trained relentlessly reached the point where raga could not stand against it, so it was bound to break up and disperse from the heart in a clearly evident way. He felt at that stage that his striving was progressing very quickly and fearlessly. When performing the regular morning and evening chanting, he did it in a brief form, for his mind was in a hurry to get on to striving with mindfulness and wisdom. He even stopped reciting the various sutta texts, which he previously chanted, in order to put all his effort into developing his mindfulness and wisdom so as to gain freedom as quickly as possible while there was still time, he was afraid that he would die before he got to his desired goal, the Arahat Tatamma.